Is that Mr. Takei? George? Hi. <laughs> How are you, sir? Just fine. How are you? <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> are you playing it up? Or you, and that's Am just, I what? That's just a golden voice. Oh, well, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll mention this so I don't forget in case we get wrapped up in something else. You're here Saturday and Sunday in Las Colinas at the Irving Convention Center. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Off uh, Irving Convention Center. What is it? One, <laughs> one is it like off one fourteen in Northwest Highway? Yes, that's yeah. it exactly. The Irving Convention Center. It's for the fan days. Saturday eleven to six. Sunday eleven to four. Is that close to the lodge? Uh, yeah, it's not too far from it. That's a topless bar. You would know about that, George. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know the landscape there, but uh, I know about the uh, Texan culture, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> a topless bar. Oh, what's I forgot that sniggery I... guy here? What was going to ask now? <laughs> uh, uh, do you have to feign interest when you go to these conventions, or are you really just appreciative of the people that come out? Uh, the uh, latter, because, you know, it's the fans that made uh, Star Trek and my career and, my, and subsequent uh, series that, that I've done. I did Heroes a uh, uh, few years back, and now I'm currently doing uh, Super Ninjas for... Nickelodeon, and it's the uh, fans that keep the uh, ratings up for us and keep us uh, working, so uh, I'm very grateful to their support. I understand. Just at a certain point, everybody's got a story. It's like, dude, I've talked about these stories. I've got it. I was in Star Trek. I remember all the episodes. You don't have to remind me of all of them. I would just lose my mind at a certain point. <laughs> Well, most fans are pretty uh, understanding of the situation. You know, this is the 45th anniversary of Star Trek. I mean, that's that's really been unheard of. Because we were on television uh, for only three seasons, and our ratings were very low. And uh, uh, so they had the uh, numbers to justify cancellation. And then we became a series of um, uh, feature motion pictures and a lot of uh, Star Trek spinoffs, you know, uh, uh, the Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, uh, Enterprise. What, was it pretty much the advent of Star Wars that was the like the catalyst for the Star Trek movies? Exactly. I think it was in 1978, was it, uh, that uh, Star Wars came out? Or no, no, it was... I think the first Star Trek movie was 79, wasn't it? Uh, no, the last Star Trek uh, series. Well, oh, the first Star Trek uh, movie was 79, and um, I think it was uh, 76 or 77 when Star Wars came, up, uh, came out, and that's what prompted them to, uh, prompted Paramount to uh, start making the series of uh, feature films. I read someplace that you didn't want to do Star Trek, what was it, uh, The Wrath of Khan, the second one? Oh, no, no, that, that was uh, not... Uh, Wrath of Khan, but Leonard didn't want to re uh, repeat, uh, Leonard Nimoy didn't want to repeat to Spock again uh, uh, in um, the uh, uh, the search for Spock. And so he dickered back and forth with Paramount, and when he got them to agree to allow him to direct, he uh, uh, agreed to go on with, uh, with uh, uh, the role the of Spock. Yeah. But you, you were on board for all the Star Trek movies, because I thought I'd read someplace that you didn't want to do one of them, and Shatner talked you into it. Um, no. <laughs> well, I guess so. It was number five, <laughs> the one that he was directing. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in that one either. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't too keen to, uh, to take uh, orders from him. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I turned that down. And then he got Nichelle to call me. She's a very dear friend. And Nichelle said, uh, uh, you know, we miss you very much. You've got to come back. We're doing a, a table read. And I said, uh, am I uh, guessing wrong when I say Bill put you up to this? And she said, no, but, <laughs> but I want you back, too. And uh, uh, Nichelle was very persuasive. And she's a dear friend. I can't say no to her. So I agreed to uh, grip my teeth and work with Bill again. <laughs> now, now the upside to Star Trek V was because it was a flop at the box office. Yes. Then came Star Trek VI because they didn't want to end the franchise on a down note. 
Exactly. And, uh, in my opinion, that's the uh, very best of the uh, Star Trek movies. Well, that's because you and got your own command in six, wasn't exactly it? Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they, they subtitled it uh, The Voyage or uh, uh, The Undiscovered Country. But I think it really should have been called Captain Sulu to the Rescue. <laughs> because <laughs> Captain Kirk would have been a goner if it hadn't been for... Uh, uh, a Sulu coming out of the darkened galaxy sky to blow the Klingons away. That's right. Near the end of the movie, you show up out of nowhere. Exactly. <laughs> I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about that particular scene. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's like all of a sudden, here comes a Sulu, and it's just like, it's like Sulu's revenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saved him, uh, that aging captain. <laughs> that uh, final uh, classic Star Trek scene that always ends... Uh, on the bridge of the Enterprise, this time a humbled, grateful Captain Kirk looks up to that giant image of Captain Sulu on the view screen, and in essence he says, thank you for saving my ass. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, uh, Sulu says, uh, good to see you in action one more time, Captain. And then he roars off, and uh, McCoy is looking at that uh, ship, the Excelsior, that I'm the captain of, and he says, by God, that's a big ship. And uh, Scotty, with a twinkle in his eyes, uh, chimes in, aye, but not so big as that a captain. Captain, you're right. <laughs> that is a Captain Sulu movie. What, did, <laughs> did everybody have issues? And I know you've visited this over and over. Did everybody have issues with Shatner from the... Everybody, everybody, <laughs> including <laughs> Leonard. Uh, really? Because autobiography. I thought they were really tight. Uh, well, that's the, uh, Perception. the uh, public uh, image that they present. But uh, in reality, there, there's one um, incident I still remember. Um, Leonard was, you know, uh, Bill was supposed to be the ostensible star. But uh, when the uh, series premiered and uh, went into the first season... Leonard was the one that ran away with all the fan mail that was coming in. You know, in those days, we didn't have email. We had people that put, uh, wrote letters, fan letters, and they put a postage stamp on it, and they mailed it in. No, you're right. I watched, uh, it, was like the, it was on PBS, The Pioneers of Television, and they did one on sci-fi, and they talked about as much as Shatner tried to focus on the role of Kirk and make that the forefront, it was Spock that actually jumped ahead. He was the most popular uh, character, and uh, TV Guide wanted to do a, a, a pictorial feature on Leonard uh, uh, getting made into uh, uh, Mr. Spock, and so and, and you know Leonard always was the first one in makeup because his makeup took so long, the pointy ears and the eyebrows going up, and uh, so um, uh, the photographer was there photographing the various stages of uh, Leonard Nimoy becoming Mr. Spock. You guys all right with this? Bob Anybody bored? Oh, hell right. Right. Uh, Bill, Bill Shatner uh, came in to get his makeup uh, put on, and he sees this photo spread being done on uh, Leonard. And he saw that. He, he turned around, walked out, made a phone call to the front office. We later discovered that, that he had written into his contra uh, contract approval rights for any photographer on the set. And, uh, well, they weren't there to take pictures of Shatner. What? They, why would he have a problem if they were there to do a story on Nimoy and, and not him? What do you care if there's a photographer on the set? That's right. Uh, you know, it's helping the show. Uh, the, the show would get that much more uh, coverage because they're doing a piece on uh, Leonard. But Bill did not like that because it wasn't <laughs> on Bill Shatner. And so he had the um, photographer dismissed. Which, of course, didn't sit well with Leonard. No, because then he's going to miss his TV Guide story. Exactly. Now, and wait, so he said, you know, why is the, the uh, photographer not here? Why did he? Uh, why was he uh, sent away? And the uh, the makeup people said, you know, we don't know. And he says, well, there's no point in putting any more makeup on. So he strode out with the uh, sheet still over uh, his shoulders and uh, uh, went into his dressing room. And... Um, it sounds like a bunch of kids in, in preschool. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not doing this. I'm going to take my ears and go home. Well, I mean, I, 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 Leonard's position is understandable. I, I certainly no. would have back, backed him up. Then the rest of us came, and we uh, got into makeup and uh, reported to the set, but uh, no Leonard. <laughs> and so the front office people, the black suits, uh, came rushing in, and they went to Leonard's uh, 
dressing room and they chatted uh, they they must have been uh, confirmed with him uh, with him for about 10 15 minutes and then they go they'd go into uh, Bill's dressing room and <laughs> confer and then they'd go back into Leonard's and in the what? meantime we're just sitting around you know sipping coffee and the assistant came and said, why don't you guys uh, take a nice long break? It, it, it doesn't look like this is going to be resolved very soon. So we... Well, maybe take five weeks, call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we went down to the commissary and uh, had a early morning uh, snack. And we strolled back after about uh, 45 minutes thinking, surely it would have been set, uh, settled by this time. It's probably going to take him a couple and of days to finish this story. How long before we need a break? Still no activity, no right. lights lit, uh, and the uh, suits going back and forth between uh, Bill and Leonard's dressing rooms. And so we sit around some more, and then it's reaching uh, almost 11.30, and the assistant comes and says, uh, why don't you guys take an early lunch and <laughs> take, take your time, have a leisurely lunch. And so we went for our lunch. And uh, then we uh, walked around the studio a little bit to work off the lunch, came back onto the studio. Does he think we're on PBS and we don't have any spots to run? <laughs> was finally Could be. Yeah. I'm afraid to ask him anything else. you got to ask him about the roast. We wasted a okay. whole yeah. long morning. And, you know, those are expensive mo hours there. Well, it's not just the actors standing around. I was actually surprised knowing that there was tension between everybody that you showed. How long ago was Shatner's roast? Was that three or four years ago? I think, yeah, but no, about three years ago. I actually uh, pulled a clip. Uh, I got to ask this. Your <laughs> line near the end of it, did, did you write that? Because it really sounded like it was a punchline 40 years in the making. Because when Shatner opens the roast, he shows up on one of his stallions, rides in, makes his big entrance. Exactly. And that's what gave me the idea. And I, I thought I'd save it for the very end. All right, I got the clips. I don't blow it here. Hang on. If you and the horse you rode you are a rich, gooey, devil's food cake that I want to drop my face into and go... <laughs> and when he drops the F word on him, you can tell this isn't just something he's feigning. <laughs> So, despite our tensions, I am honored that you invited me to be here with you tonight. I can finally say what I've waited 40 years to say. <laughs> F*** you and the horse you rode in on. <laughs> I and you know, that feeling uh, is shared by every one of us. <laughs> Jimmy Doohan at Star Trek conventions used to rail up and down about how uh, Bill uh, uh, took his, uh, stole his line or stole his close-up or whatever. And uh, I just can't uh, imagine pissing off an entire cast. Maybe oh, it, it isn't just our cast. You know, he did a show called... <laughs> he Hooker. pissed off Lost in Space. Anybody else did he get... Uh, yeah, T.J. Hooker, I didn't think about that. He pissed everybody off there as well? Exactly. And I don't think he was a favorite of uh, the um, cast of... Uh, what's that lawyer show? That Boston Legal. Boston Legal, that's it. Has he ever worked with anyone that liked him? You know... <laughs> when, when he does interviews, he's charming, he's witty, and he's uh, funny. You know, but uh, when you have to work with him day in, day out, it's a whole different story. <laughs> uh, I once said he has a big, shiny ego, and he said, well, at least I tend to my ego and keep it well polished, and maybe George should do the same thing. Well, the thing is, I, I, I really should have said a big, blown up, over, overgrown ego. You know, we're, all, we're actors. We all have egos. But we also have good sense. We know that we're working with other people. And when you're doing a... All right, I can't ask him nothing else. I'm going to break better. at least half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, if this, uh, uh, other actors have their... Uh, participation in it it's not all one actor that makes the scene now uh your appearance is saturday and sunday at the irving convention center are you coming in earlier or are you not getting here till saturday uh no i'm coming in uh, friday evening because you're welcome to hang out with us not like being on the stern show because we'll actually blow you <laughs> <laughs> who'll do what <laughs> who uh, russ wood who <laughs> <laughs> 
I'd like to see a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I got to. I've got to ask this really quick. Then we got a break. Uh, I know, and we had had you on this this show about ten years ago, and we had talked about. Oh, really? It. You don't have to remember. That's all right. I do so many shows. Of, uh, forgive me for not remembering. That, that's all right. Uh, I know that uh, you were like four years old living in California when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and then right. they rounded up all the Japanese Americans right. and put them in, what they call them, relocation camps? Relocation camps was the uh, euphemism. They were really prison camps. You know, barbed wire fences, sentry towers, machine guns pointed at us. When I made the no night runs uh, from my uh, barrack to the latrine, searchlights followed me, you know, so it, it, it was... Um, and you were like four, were you like four or five years old at the time? I, I was, uh, uh, well, I was uh, four years, years old at the time of uh, Pearl Harbor, but I was, I just turned five when the soldiers came to uh, order uh, my family out of uh, our home. So how long after uh, December 7th did they round up the Japanese Americans? Uh, President Roosevelt signed the order in February of 1942, and it was March, uh, no, uh, May of uh, 42 that our family was uh, or uh, picked up. Now, they actually did. They ask you to report, or did the soldiers actually come to your home? Oh no, I'll never forget. Uh, you know, I was a kid, but I remember my parents uh, hurriedly packing one night, and then the next morning they uh, dressed us, and I was in the living room looking out the uh, front window. And I saw two uh, soldiers with uh, 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 bayonets flashing in the sun come stomping up um, our driveway and then uh, stomped up the front step to, to, to our front door, banged on the door. And my father answered it, and he ordered us out. And so we picked up our luggage, and they put us on uh, a truck that took us d down to downtown Los Angeles where we were all assembled. Now, how long were you in the uh, relocation camps? For the duration of the war, uh, I was eight years old when I came back. So three, well, over three years? Yeah. Four years. Was it hard to imagine that when all this is going on, this is happening in the United States? To Americans who happen to be of Japanese ancestry. You know, my mother was born in Sacramento. My father was a San Franciscan. I was born in Los Angeles. So, you know, and there were no charges. It was the most unconstitutional act. But, you know, in this country, when you're arrested, you have a right to know why you're being arrested. Supposed and then to. you have a right to challenge them in a trial. You know, it's called due process. We had no due process. Now, did, did, because did, we looked, looked like the people who bombed Pearl Harbor, we were rounded up and put, in, put into these barbed wire camps. Did you get a sense of deja vu after September 11th when a lot of people in this country wanted to lock up the Muslims only because of the religion? Exactly. But, you know, for me, it wasn't deja vu because I was too young then to understand what was really happening. Uh, but as uh, an adult, you know, having uh, studied about and, ta uh, and talked with my parents about and talked with other people about the internment, I understood what that was. And so when uh, September 11th, uh, 2001 happened, I immediately, uh, and I happened to be the chairman of the Japanese American National Museum, and so we organized a, a candlelight ceremony on, in the plaza, on the plaza of our uh, museum, and we invited leaders from the uh, Arab American community. And because our museum happens to be uh, uh, three blocks from City Hall, that candlelight ceremony turned into a candlelight march to City Hall and back. And then a month later, we organized a symposium in the Great Hall of the uh, Japanese American National Museum. This is my fault because I asked. Invited, uh, it's interesting. Yes, well, it is. Just uh, the, the four-year-old uh, had to go through the, this. Uh, Arab American community, uh, um, the uh, chairman of the uh, uh, Human Relations Commission of the County of Los Angeles, um, a member of the um, a representative from the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, and we extended an invitation to the FBI. We need a the break. FBI was the only one that demurred, and it was um, uh, moderated by... Uh, yeah, he's got Katie somebody Kelly off of in the middle of this. Of bad enough, FBI, I'm talking over him. And it was broadcast on Never knew Max so Bear. We, Japanese Americans <laughs> I miss Max Bear. <laughs> what might be happening <laughs> to uh, Arab Americans after... Uh, September 11th, and sure enough, I mean, it certainly didn't happen on the scale of uh, uh, what happened to Japanese Americans, you know, being put into prison camps, but uh, 
the FBI, FBI uh, descended on uh, oh, my uh, leaders head. of the <laughs> Arab American community. Some people were. You know, set up like, this interview. Uh, there was a story I'll of uh, I'll get you, you Arab fat American bastard. scientist uh, <laughs> in New Jersey working uh, at it. This, Would he actually uh, know if we went into a break? And the FBI uh, comes uh, uh, striding know. into the uh, <laughs> place of work. Uh-huh. Clamp. <laughs> Uh, handcuffs on him the rest and march him only on uh, out of the building Eagle. in front of all his uh, co-workers. Really? Uh, outrageous. You know, and then in Arizona, there was a case of uh, uh-huh. 